In the last video, we designed a basic 32-bit adder, and that was an adder that I described as a ripple carry adder. And in this video, I'm going to take some steps towards optimizing this ripple carry adder. So we'd already had this discussion in the previous video where we said that you have a basic one-bit add unit that generates a carry out, which then feeds the next one-bit ALU. That generates a carry, which feeds the next one-bit ALU and so on. Right, and this is done 32 times until you finally produce your your 32nd bit. And so we said that going through one of these add units takes about a handful of sequential logic delays, right? So let's say it takes about you know five gate delays to go through one of these add units, and this might equal some number, let's say 100 picoseconds. And now if I have to do this sequentially 32 times the overall add operation is going to take 3200 picoseconds, right? So this can be a fairly slow process if I'm doing a 32-bit add and I'm, and I'm doing it sequentially one bit at a time. Now, if you look at the entire add operation, right? I'm taking a 32-bit input A and a 32-bit input B and performing the addition to produce a new output, which is a 32-bit number C. This is a combinational circuit. That means given the values of A and B, I'm going to provide a unique 32-bit result C. So what I can do is construct a truth table for the circuit, right? The truth table is going to be fairly large. It's going to have 64 numbers over here because I need 32 bits for, to represent the possible values for A, 32 bits to represent the possible values for B. And then there will be 32 outputs which correspond to the bits for C. Okay, so this is going to be a fairly complicated truth table. There are going to be 2 to the power 64 rows because the number of possible inputs is 2 to the power 64. And for each one of those cases, I'm going to have a bunch of bits over here that indicate what each of the bits of C is, is, is going to be given a particular set of inputs. This is a very, very complicated truth table, but it does exist. And when I have a truth table like this, I know that the final result can be expressed as a sum of products, right? So bit number zero, so C0, could be expressed as a very large sum of products. So I'm going to look at all of the cases under which C0 is one, right? So there'll be multiple cases over here under which C0 is going to be one. And for each of those cases, I'm going to come up with a product term, and then I'm going to add those up. And similarly, you know, for C1 all the way until C32, I can come up with a sum of products term. What that tells me is that the value of C32 and the value of any of these bits can be computed by going through just two gates. This is essentially a sum of products. So I need to compute a bunch of product terms in the first step, and they can all be done in parallel. Right? There'll be a whole bunch of AND gates, but they can all perform their operations in parallel. And then I'm going to have one massive OR gate over here that combines the results from each of these AND gates. Okay, so the entire addition can be computed by going sequentially through two gates, right? You can go through a bunch of ANDs in parallel, and once that is done, I then go sequentially through the next OR gate. Okay, so I don't really need to go through, you know, 160 gate delays, which is what we were doing here, where every operation was taking five gate delays, and then I was sequentially going through 32 such operations, right? But in this case, I can be done in as little as two gate delays. So in some sense, this represents a theoretical best bound on performance, right? But this is not quite true. This is only two gate delays and this is 160 gate delays. But a gate in this case was very simple. It was an AND or an OR gate that had only two or three inputs. In this case, each of these, each of these gates could have a very, very large number of inputs. In fact, the AND gate over here could have as many as 64 inputs. And this OR gate over here could have an exponentially large number of inputs, right? Because we know that there are 2 to the power 64 rows. So there's a very large number of cases under which a certain bit, say C31, could be set to 1. So there's a really large number of inputs over here that are being fed to the OR gate, right? So saying two gate delays is a little misleading because each of these gates is humongous. This might actually end up taking much longer than 3200 picoseconds because each gate is itself so large and so slow. Okay, so what we're going to try and do is come up with a sweet spot that is somewhere in between, which does not require us to go through as many sequential gate delays as the ripple carry adder, and that does not have 
super large gates such as this hypothetical extreme design that I came up with over here. Okay, so we're going to come up with something that's in between. It's going to be referred to as a carry look ahead adder. And what we're going to do is use a modest number of gates, use a modest number of sequential gates that need to be traversed, and use a moderate number of inputs to each one of these gates, right? So hopefully this will give us a sweet spot in terms of latency and help us do the addition as quickly as possible. So in order to show how this is done, you know, we have to go through a few Boolean algebra equations and show how I can decompose a very large equation into a small collection of relatively simple equations. So let's look at this carry in value. This is the value that has essentially tripped us up, right? The ripple carry adder was slow because I had to produce the carry out. That would then go to the next stage, would go to the next stage and so on, right? So it's this process of carrying that I need to somehow optimize. So this is an equation for the carry that I had that I had produced on a previous slide. So the value of the carry coming out of any given stage or the carry in going to block number one is the result of computations performed in block number zero. So at block number zero, I'm going to do, I'm going to take the corresponding input bits, A0 and B0, and those two. Then I'm going to take A0 and it with the carry in coming to the stage, take B0 and it with the carry in coming to the stage, and then take an OR of all of the three terms. Similarly, for the next one bit ALU, the carry coming out of that is going to be a function of its input bits, A1 and B1, and the carry that is coming into that stage, which is the carry that was produced by the previous stage, right? So this is the same equation as before, but the zeros have just been changed into ones. Now I can expand this term by looking at this carry in term here and expanding it into its bigger form over here. And if I do that, I produce this really complicated equation. And if I keep doing that, right? So if I, if I were to take the trouble of computing the next term, Right, this would be even longer. Right, it would go. In, it would spill into multiple lines of of uh, equations, and you can see that the complexity is exploding really fast. Right, so by the time I get into carry in 32, that's a really really large term. In fact, the complexity of this equation goes up exponentially. Right, so what I'm producing over here is actually the sum of products term that I mentioned over here. Right, so this logic over here becomes very very complicated. Okay, so this example kind of shows you how if I naively just kept expanding the equations, I would end up with a very, very complicated term that is very, very hard to implement in hardware. Okay, so I need to do something a little bit smarter. And the way I do that is by introducing this abstraction of a generate signal and a propagate signal. So I look at the same equation here. This is exactly the same equation I had on the previous slide. So the carry coming out of a given stage, I, is a function of the inputs to that stage, so AI and BI, and the carry in that came into that stage. I reorganize this term to produce this equation over here, which says that if A and B are large enough, right, so if A and B are both ones, then there is a sufficiently large quantity that is being added over here that I am going to generate a carry, right? So if AI and BI are both ones, I'm going to generate a carry myself. I don't really need to look at the carry signal coming into me. My bits are so large that I'm bound to generate a carry. So AI.BI is referred to as the generate signal. Then I have the second term over here and I look at AI plus BI. If any one of those two is one, then this signal is going to be a one. So if AI is zero and BI is one, it means that my AI plus BI signal is going to be one. But just adding a zero and a one is not a large enough quantity that I'm going to produce a carry. But if the carry in signal was a one, then adding these three bits is going to give me a carry signal, right? So what it's saying is that if AI plus BI is one, then perhaps I'm not adding big enough numbers to generate a carry. But if a carry in is, is provided to me, then now the numbers are big enough that I will generate a carry, right? So AI plus BI is referred to as a propagate signal which means that by myself, I'm not adding big enough numbers to generate a carry, but if a carry in comes in, then my numbers are big enough that I'm going to propagate this carry on to the next stage, right? So my numbers are either big enough that I can generate my own carry, or my numbers are sufficiently big enough that if I get a carry, I will pass it on, right? So this is referred to as the propagate signal, right? So this is just an abstraction. I have not really changed the equation in any way. I have not changed the logic in any way. 
I've just found a way to kind of express this equation in a form that is somewhat intuitive. Okay, so the carry being generated out of a stage I equals my generate signal plus my propagate signal times the carry in coming into me, right? Where GI is AI dot BI and PI is AI plus BI, right? So this is something that I can compute in the very first cycle. The values of generate and propagate are determined entirely by my inputs A and B. They are not a function of the carry that might be coming in from the previous stages, right? But the carry out of a given stage is indeed a function of the carry that comes out of the previous stage. Okay, so all we've done is kind of reorganize this equation to come up with this slightly more intuitive form. I've not yet explained why this is useful. Okay, now let's let's carry on to the next slide. So now I'm again going to go through this exercise of coming up with equations for C1, C2, C3, C4, and so on. This is the same exercise I went through over here, right? I said this is C1, C2, C3, C4, and I very quickly gave up saying that this is this equation is exploding in my face and you know it's having an exponential number of terms so i'm going to stop doing that let me repeat that exercise now but i'm going to take advantage of this generate and propagate signals that i've just defined right so if i express my equations in terms of generate and propagate what does it produce so c1 is generate provided by bit 0 plus propagate provided by bit 0 multiplied by the carry 0 coming in then C2 is exactly is, is going to have the exact same form where it is G1 plus P1 times C1. I can start substituting the value of C1 from here and expand this equation a little bit more. So when I do that, it gives me G1 plus P1 times G0 plus P1 times P0 times C0. I continue doing that. I produce an equation for C3, produce an equation for C4. Okay, so you can see that this is starting to get a little complex, right? I've used up an entire line. You know, C5 is going to need more than one line. So things are getting more complicated, but it's not getting out of control. What you'll see over here is that the number of terms in each of these equations is going up only linearly. And the number of inputs in each one of these terms is also going up only linearly, right? So for C1, I was adding up two terms and the biggest term was a two input AND gate. In this case, I'm doing an R of five terms and the biggest gate was a five input AND gate, right? And, and so on. So if I finally go through this entire exercise and produce C32, it's going to be the R of 33 terms and the last term is going to be an AND of 33 terms, right? So no gate is going to have more than 33 inputs to it.